Recently, I had the opportunity and the privilege of speaking at the main event, one of Perry Stone's meetings during the year. And several thousand people gather on his huge campus there in Cleveland, Tennessee. And the message that you're about to see is called The Highest Life. It's a message about the kingdom of God. And it's a message that I really feel like people miss today when they read the Bible or even in churches. Because God did not give us a gospel of the, of the church. He gave us a gospel of the kingdom. And the highest life you, can, you and I can live is by living the laws of the kingdom of God. I want you to hear this. I, it's unedited. We're sharing it with you. I believe with all of my heart it will open your eyes to an adventure in God's kingdom. Just, just before you're seated, I know you've been standing a long time, but let me tell you two things that weigh heavy on my heart every day. We've come to a day and time when we have gotten so far away from true, authentic, biblical worship until we no longer recognize it. Worship is not praise. Praise adores him for what he has done. Worship acknowledges who he is. And we go to God so much with our hand up to receive from his hand that we forget to go with our hand up in submission to his lordship. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. We live in a church world and I'm all for church. I believe in the church. I, I, I've been there almost 50 years. I was 12, I think, when I went there or something like that. I believe in the church. Jesus used the word church twice. It's used three times in the Gospels, but over and over and over again, more than 170 times in the New Testament, he refers to the kingdom. And he never says, I came to give you a church. He says, I came to give you a kingdom. And the kingdom needed an agency to work through. And so he gave us the church. More than discipleship, I believe in discipleship. More than training, I believe in training. More than Bible schools, I believe in Bible schools. More than missions, I believe in missions. More than anything you can name relative to the church, I believe in it all, I do it all. We have missed something when we don't become kingdom-minded people. There is no gospel of the church, there is only a gospel of the kingdom. And when we come to grasp that and understand that, we'll stop putting so much emphasis on all of those other things and we'll start putting emphasis on worship. Because if we don't come back to the place of worship, we will never take our churches, our cities, our towns, our states, our whole country for Jesus Christ. We need to come back to the place of worship because here's what happens when, when worship takes place. When worship takes place, go look at it in the Bible. Men, women close their mouths. Because when he shows up in the midst of worship, you have nothing to say. You fall as though you're dead at John's feet. You fall out in the spirit on the rooftop if you're Peter. The power of the kingdom of God. Lord, could you just help me today? I humbly beseech you by your mercies that somehow, God, I could open up my own heart and cause, cause these men and women to see a picture of your kingdom, perhaps, God, that they have never seen. Not because of anything that I am or have, but because of who you are. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I'm gonna share two, two scriptures with you and I'll come back to these scriptures during the course of the message. One of the things that always kind of confuses me about the preaching of the word is, is oftentimes when uh, people will give us a text and they never get back to it. I, I like to know why they had that. So let's, let's go to Mark chapter one and, and verse 15 and, and, in, and, and just studying the word myself. Perhaps the most powerful statement that Jesus Christ ever made 
about our involvement in his kingdom is this verse. I want you to read it out loud with me, please. And saying, the appointed period of time is fulfilled, completed, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, have a change of mind, which issues in regret for past sins and in change of conduct for the better, and believe, trust in, rely on, and adhere to the good news, the gospel. Then I want to go to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5. I sat in class at Lee University, Lee College at the time. I was in a Greek class. Dr. French Arrington, one of the greatest Greek scholars in the world, was teaching. And he showed me a passage of scripture that I, 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 I couldn't even understand it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't grasp what it meant. So I stayed after class. And I said, I, I just need you to show me this verse. Read it out loud with me. And have felt how good the word of God is and the mighty powers of the age and world to come. Now, I want you to notice the top part. He says, we have now felt in this life right now. Say right now. We have felt in this life how good the word of God is and the mighty powers of the age and the world to come. So what he's telling us is there is a world within our world. There is the world of the kingdom of God on earth and in heaven. And there is the world that is the earth, the God of this world that we know to be Satan himself. And Jesus comes and according to Dr. Arrington from the French, from the French, from the Greek translation of the scripture, comes this picture of two worlds overlapping. And where the overlap is between the two worlds is where the kingdom of God is manifested. And everywhere that the kingdom of God is manifested, God rules in that particular area. So when you hear about a revival breaking out, years ago, the Pensacola Revival, I was there, witnessed it for myself. John Kilpatrick, great man. And I can tell you that I, I felt the presence of the kingdom of God because the, the world that is to come and the world that is here in the form of the power of the Holy Spirit, those two worlds overlap there for several years. And an, an amazing thing took place. Now, the beauty of all of that is you don't have to be John Kilpatrick. You don't have to be a church. You actually have the power to bring the world to come into your circumstance. You can speak those things as though they're nothing and they shall be. That's what the Bible says. Many years ago, there was a woman by the name of Irma Bombeck, and I'm sure that some of you perhaps heard of her. She's a great writer. I loved reading after her. She had humor, but she was very smart. And this is something she said that I think so depicts our age. People are going crazy because there's no stability here in our lives. There is no anchor. There is no center. People don't seem to hang on to and believe in anything anymore. People are really confused and they have lost their way. I've never seen a day like today. I did not think in my whole lifetime that anyone would ever question whether or not there were more than two sexes, a male and a female. I never thought I would ever live on that day. But we live in a world of confused people. And the confusion of our age has been created in part because of the lack of the teaching of the Word of God. Because where the Word of God is taught in its simplicity and its purity and its power, the Word of God has the power to transform lives, transform churches, and transform nations if we just simply put our faith and trust in that Word. It could easily be said of our day, confusion abounds on every hand because in fact, it really does. Confusion abounds. Someone as well said that we're so immersed in living that we've forgotten what life is for. We just live to live. And something is missing. Something is missing in our churches. We have so many churches across our nation where on Sunday morning or Saturday night or whenever it is they have church or Sunday night, they come together and they have a celebration. 
And the vast majority of church today is about celebration. And there's nothing wrong with celebration. But there's not a lot of worship. And you need worship to bring the kingdom of God, the power of the kingdom of the almighty God. So the question for us becomes this thing called life. And my question always is, will you really live before you die? Will you really live before you die? Psychologists tell us, by and large, the vast majority of them, that most people will live and will never really know who they really are. They will never come to the knowledge of their identity. And so they will become someone or something because someone wants them to do that. It's like the surgeon over on the East Coast some 25, 30 years ago had become such a great surgeon, renowned in his early 50s now. He had been elected Surgeon of the Year, a prestigious award given by an Eastern University. And he was there that night at a banquet, thousands of people present to receive his award. His mom and dad were doctors. And he stood up to make his speech. And at the end of his speech, this is what he said. And as of tonight, I am resigning from my position. I will no longer be a surgeon. I will no longer work in the medical community. And people were aghast. He was like the premier surgeon that anybody knew. He, he was the best at his craft, at his trade. And he could wrote it, he could rent his ticket to anywhere he wanted to go. And, and people are like just with their mouths open. What? His, his mom and dad, the same. And he said, I have decided there are things that I want to do in my life other than what other people want me to do. I became a doctor because my mom and dad wanted me to be a doctor and because they wanted me to be a doctor, I became the best doctor I could possibly be. Afterwards, there was a press conference and a reporter said to him, so sir, may I ask, doctor, what will you be doing now? He said, I am going down to the hills of West Virginia, one of the most beautiful places in our nation. And I have purchased a bed and breakfast and my wife are going to run it together. That's been our dream for a long time. Now you could look at that and you could say, wow, how, how could you walk away from such a lucrative position and such prestige and, and go and live in a West Virginia and a bed and breakfast? But you see, what he was saying is this, I have finally come to know who I am and who I am is not who I have become. So the only possibility you see of you and I really understanding who we really are comes out of Psalms 139. It is so profound, it is so in your face until you have to read it several times and let it really sink in and you have to pick up on the Hebrew. So let me just kind of give it to you in street language style. Before the sperm met the egg and you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you and wrote a book about your life. Now you try to get by that verse. I got stumped on it. I read it. I've read it a thousand times. I may read it another thousand times. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, God knew me. He knew you. And the question for all of us is this. What has caused you to become who you are? And are you living your true identity? Are you the person God created you to be? When I look around at church today, I, I, I get disillusioned myself. Can I just be honest here? I'm a pastor, almost 50 years now. And, and, and I go to church, uh, Brian, and I mean this from, from a sincere heart. And, 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 and a few years ago, I said to God, I, I'm tired of going to church. I, I'm tired of having 15 to 20 to 30 minutes of praise and worship. I already know all the songs unless they sing a new one. And, and, and I, I learned that one and, and they'll sing it a couple of three times and we'll move on to the next one. And, and then we have this message and, and, and then we come to the close and we have an altar call and we pray for people and we go home. And people come back next week. And you know, after a while, that really gets monotonous. It's kind of like the same old, same old. And, and after a while, you're wondering and, and, and you're thinking to yourself, Jesus was the greatest adventurer that ever walked the face of this earth. Everywhere he went was an adventure. 
And when he went around, he went around and the blinded eyes were open and the deaf ears were unstopped and the lame were made to walk and the deaf got up out of a casket and money was found wherever he wanted to find it. Let me tell you what he was saying. He was saying, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you the kingdom. When you find someone who has blinded eyes, step into the kingdom and cause those eyes to be open. When you find someone who has deaf ears, you step into the kingdom and you command those ears to be open. Whatsoever things you bind on earth, I'll recognize as being bound in heaven. And whatsoever things you bind on earth, I'll recognize as being bound in heaven. In essence, here you go. Get out there. Have an adventure. Have a wonderful life. Go do adventurous things. Step into the world of darkness and bring light. Speak my name. Decree my power. And watch my kingdom begin to flow through you. Because the only hope we have of knowing who we are is to know what our kingdom identity is. Who am I as far as the kingdom of God is concerned? Who did God make me to be? Who did he create me? Why do I not like vanilla ice cream? Why is it that I think peaches are the greatest fruit that God ever put on the earth? And someone else thinks it's strawberries. And I try to convince them it's not. But for them it is, you see, because we're all, you just have to hold your thumb out. Please, just stick your thumb out there, please, for me. And you just stick it out there and then flip it around and look at it. Just, just, there's a print on that thumb. Right now there's about, there's about 15 billion thumbs on the earth and no two of them are alike. And about 20 billion people have lived since Adam. And in that 20 billion people, those 40 billion thumbs, not any two of them was alike. You can be identified by your thumbprint. If you can be identified by your thumbprint, I think there's a God up there that says you're special. You're the only person who has this. Next time you're feeling down, just flip that thumb around and just talk to yourself a little bit and say, you're the apple of his eye. As a matter of fact, you could quote some verses. You could go to Psalms chapter eight and verse five, and you could say, I was made a little lower than God. I was made above the angels, but a little lower than God, because that's exactly what that verse says. Imagine God telling us that I made you just a little bit lower than me. And then ask yourself, am I living like that? Am I living just a little bit lower than God? Do my words have power? Am I able to speak into darkness and command it to leave? Am I able to take hold of the moment that I live in and milk it for everything that is inside of it? Who am I? Kingdom life is the highest possible strategy on the face of the earth. You can't live a better life than a kingdom life. And when you live the kingdom life, you begin to live life. Life is what happens to you when you are getting ready to live. I'll let that soak in for a moment and come back to it. Life is happening to you every single day. Every single day, something's happening to you. I know some of you will say, yes, I'm getting older. Old is a dirty word. I think it's carnal. I don't think anyone should be, should be able to call anybody old. Because you see, if you study the scriptures very carefully and you go to the book of Genesis, you find out what aging is in the Bible. From zero to 40 is your youth. From 41 to 80 are your middle years. From 81 to 120, those are your mature years, not your older years. Your mature years. Wouldn't you rather be known as a mature person than an old person? Have I got the right crowd here this morning? Maturity. And what is your spiritual IQ? How much wisdom do you have to operate in the kingdom? How much do you pray for? How much do you pray in? Because the kingdom of God is all about wisdom. Actually, it's about revelation. Here is our problem today. We have the greatest day that we've ever lived as far as wisdom and knowledge being printed in books. We have some of the greatest books out. Brian has great books. Perry has great books. I love books. I have a library of over 3,500 books. I'm a, I'm a big book person. I love to read books. I love to glean from them. But you see, a lot of those books contain what men believe that God is saying to them and they may very well be right. I don't question that. But here's what we need. We need revelation. 
And the problem we have is that we don't have enough worship to get revelation because you don't get revelation without worship. You don't get revelation without being in his presence. You don't get revelation unless the glory shows up. Your mind is not made keen and your spirit is not made sharp until the glory of the Lord is revealed in the midst of you and the presence of the living God begins to overwhelm and overcome you. His presence, his power, his glory, his authority. The message of the kingdom of God is about worship. Before everything else, worship. You want to do discipleship? Glory to God. Do it. Go for it. But worship first. And when you worship, strange things begin to happen. An anointing from heaven comes up on your life. The good news of his kingdom message is that all of God's power, all of God's power, all of God's power, is now available to the weakest Christian on the earth. It's amazing what Jesus said about John the Baptist. I read the verses and I, even to this day, I'm I'm astounded. He said, as great as John the Baptist was, and listen to Jesus describe John the Baptist, greater than any man born of woman. Of all the men born of woman, John the Baptist is the greatest. But the next thing he says is like off the charts. He says, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Oh my God. How could that be? I mean, just think of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. The one who came before him, the one who came to announce him, the one who came to pave the way for Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, to do what he was doing. And, and even John, with, and all of his power and all of his authority, and, and now listen, you just have to understand John, probably one of the greatest pastors that ever lived, the greatest evangelist that ever lived, because his ministry was all out in the wilderness where nobody went. Nobody took a vacation to the wilderness and nobody took a weekend to the wilderness. And he's out there in the wilderness. And what does he look like? He's got animal skins on. He's got long hair. He's a weird looking dude. He's got a beard. And yet the people are flocking out to hear John the Baptist. And what is he preaching? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A message of repentance. Powerful man. And yet when he's sitting in prison, what happens to him? The enemy comes to pound on him like he does us. And finally, John says to his disciple, go and ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? I read that and I look at myself and I think all those times that I've gone through very difficult places, sometimes, God, where in the world are you? Thank God I have good company. John the Baptist Oh, I go back and I say, John, John, I'm so thankful for your life because now my confusion, my doubts sometimes, I can work through them because you had doubts. You wondered. And what did Jesus send back? What did Jesus tell him? And go back and tell him, blinded eyes are open, deaf ears are unstopped. The lame are made to walk, the death are raised to life. The power of God is being manifested. If there's anything we should be known for, especially in Pentecostal charismatic circles, I consider myself to be a classic Pentecostal. I'm not even sure the definition of classic Pentecostal, but I consider myself to be one of those. I still believe in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I still believe in the mighty gifts of the Holy Spirit. I still believe in the unction and the function of the mighty Holy Spirit of the living God. I still believe that God gets a hold of a man and shakes him to the core of his being. And I still believe that God allows the devil to walk around on earth for only one reason. He would like for you and I to defeat the devil on a daily basis to show him that Jesus does not have to be here in the flesh, that he's got a bunch of little Jesuses walking around. Every single day of our life, we pass people who need help. They need deliverance. They need the message of the kingdom of God. They need you to step into their world. Just think about this. Many times I've asked God, why is the enemy allowed such freedom? 
I think of the Muslim population far outnumbering and growing larger every day by birth. Christians, believers. And it's scary when you look at it because around 2050 or 2060, the Muslim religion at the current rate is going to swamp Christianity as far as numbers. And I look at all of that and I say to myself, why are you allowing Satan such freedom? Why is he given such free reign in governments, in people groups, in America? How in the world did the far left hijack our government? I am not political. I am not a politician. I'm neither Republican or Democrat or independent. I'm a Christian. I vote Christian principles. I vote by the word of God. But the far left has hijacked our government and taken us so far left, we can't even believe it's happened. And if they, don't, if they are not arrested at some point, and I believe they will be, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, I believe they will be. I, I'm one of those people who believes in the coming move of God in this country. You just have to go back and look at history and understand God will let Satan have more rope and more rope and more rope. And eventually the rope he gives him, he will hang him with it. And so there is going to come a move of God in this nation. A powerful move of the Holy Spirit of the living God. An anointing like you've never seen before. We've become so complacent. We go to our church. We go through our ritual of celebration. Maybe we have two minutes of worship. Maybe we have individual people that get into worship. But by and large, the vast body of Christ does not know a lot about worship. Because you see, when worship comes, man's organization ceases. And man's control ceases. And the only thing there is God in his presence and people that he's blessing with his presence. And in that moment, you're not looking at your watch. You're not expecting the service to be over in 50 or 60 minutes and walk out the door. And the reason why we're in the mess we're in is for so many years, we've soft peddled the gospel of Jesus Christ and we've soft peddled the kingdom and we've tried to build great church buildings and great church numbers. But at the very expense of the mighty presence of the glory of the living mighty God, which the Bible clearly he says, men won't understand. Vast majority of Pentecostal churches today do not have an operation of the mighty gifts of the Spirit in their midst, even Pentecostal churches. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you just have to open your Bible and read. Everything written in the New Testament relative to the church, the kingdom, is written to believers. When we come together to worship, it is for believers to be empowered by a kingdom message. We come together to receive strength because we've been out there fighting the war all week long. We've been walking into the kingdom of darkness and we've been spreading light. Now we need some more light. We need some more revelation, but that only comes through worship. And so when you read the theology of the New Testament, this is what you must come to. Paul himself said it, one of the brightest of the bright, other than Jesus Christ, no man ever walked on the face of the earth with a greater mind, the apostle Paul, over half of the New Testament written by him. When Brian, you know this as well as I, when he couldn't find a Greek word that would fit what he wanted to say under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he just pulled two or three words together and made a brand new word. You'll find words that Paul wrote nobody else used. They didn't even exist before Paul. Smart, brilliant. And what does he say to the Corinthian church? He says, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand something about worship. Worship is for the believer. It's not for the lost. I can never expect the lost man to understand worship because his heart is not given over to the Lord. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, this is what he says. So when someone comes in to your meeting, to your celebratory service, and there's a message in tongues and an interpretation. It is a sign to the unbeliever that God is in the midst. 
I, I still go back and read it because I want to make sure I'm always theologically right. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we have great Bible scholars here today. I think the only church ever started in the entire Bible was the one that began on Acts 2 and 4, in Acts 2 and 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. And, and what did they do? They went out into the streets of the city to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the only church that God ever started was a Pentecostal church. He didn't start a Baptist church. He didn't start a Methodist church. He didn't start a Presbyterian church. He started a Pentecostal church. Come on, somebody. And the world comes along and says, you're never going to win people like that. You will not win people to Jesus if you have that manifestation of gifts, if you have all this Pentecostal worship, people jumping up and down and praising God. You want, And I will admit a lot of emotionalism came into it, and I'm one of the first to put down emotionalism. I don't like it when emotionalism takes over. I like pure worship. I like pure worship because, you see, when pure worship comes, things get quiet. And what has happened to us? A message came along about 50 years ago that said there's a way to draw people to church. We can get people in church. We will give them two or three minutes of gospel and 17 minutes of good truth. Every good thing is not a God thing, but every God thing is a good thing. And so we watered down the message and we didn't allow for the move of the Holy Spirit and multiplied millions of people were swept into some kind of an experience. I don't question their salvation. That's between them and God. But by and large, Pentecostal churches begin to say, we're going to have to become more seeker sensitive. We're going to have to become more seeker friendly. And all the while, Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is saying, when the lost man, when the lost woman comes in, will they find an operation of the Holy Spirit of God that will tell them something supernatural is going on in this place? And then they will fall under conviction by the Holy Spirit. Think about the message of the gospel of the kingdom. It's so different than the message of the church. I'll say it once again. Kingdom life is the highest strategy to live your life by. The good news of the kingdom is that all the, the power of God, all the power of God that's available is available to you right now. As an individual, you don't have to wait for Perry or Brian or anybody else or Tony Scott or anybody else to come pray for you. Lay hands on yourself. The Christian life is an adventure that involves the quest, the pursuit, and the search for the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Pray like this. Manifest your kingdom realm. Cause your every pur purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is fulfilled in heaven. Verse 33. So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. You and I live in a world of doing. Everybody's doing. Have you ever noticed even... More, more mature people are walking around with those things in their ears. We're listening to something. You know, we're, we're living in a world of noise. We've, we've, all, we, we've forgotten what solitude is. We, we, we've forgotten what Jesus did when he wanted, wanted to be ready for the next day's ministry. He went and spent all night in prayer. I asked Perry when I came in this morning, did you pray all night for me? I mean, you see, Jesus, Jesus went out and prayed all night to his father. He's the son of the living God. He knew the hell he was going to face. He knew that he would walk in the wilderness where Satan himself would show up. And what did he do to prepare for it? He spent all night praying and seeking his father to be so full of the Holy Spirit that when the enemy showed up, he had an answer for everything the, the enemy brought against him. Every charge, every temptation. What we must understand and grasp is very simply this. When Jesus taught us to pray, he must have had a reason for teaching us how to pray. There must be a reason why he said, when you pray, here's what I want you to pray. Seek first my kingdom in the midst of your prayer and my righteousness. Pray that my kingdom will come and my will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those are the two things that Jesus mandated we pray about. 
on a daily basis. It's my prayer every single morning. I get up every morning at 5.20. I get to the church. I, I, it only takes me three minutes to get ready. It takes me three and a half minutes to drive to the church. And then I go into prayer. Because I want to seek, the, I want to seek God early like Jesus did. I want to seek his face. I want to hear his voice before I enter into my day. And so here's what Jesus is saying. Above all else, pray, listen to this now, for the realm of the kingdom of God to be manifested. I, I hate to do commercials, but I don't have a choice. Outside there are these little thumb drives. Is that what they call this, a thumb drive? For your computer, you just plug it into the side. So when my wife went to heaven, I only knew this much about heaven. I was in shock for almost two months. I could not believe that she left. And, and during that time, I said to God, I don't know anything about heaven. I know there is a heaven. I know angels are there. I know God is there. I know Jesus is there. People are there, obviously, you tell me. But I, I really, and I said to the church, until I'm finished, we will be talking every week about heaven. I didn't read anybody's book. Brian has a great book on heaven. I, I read nobody's book. I, I didn't read the guy's book who said when he had his vision of heaven, they had Gucci furniture. I didn't read his book either. <laughs> because I didn't have time for nonsense. I didn't read the people's books who said I died and went to heaven. This is what I saw. And this guy spun a tale like, like would be worthy of Star Wars. I said, God, I want you to show me heaven. And I started in Genesis and I went all the way through the book of Revelation. Four and a half months. 16 messages on heaven. What I found shocked me. Shocked me in a good way. I found out where heaven is. No one had ever explained to me where heaven was. I thought it was like a planet somewhere. I thought it was like a place. It is not. It's neither a planet nor a place. And the Bible is very clear because it uses this one word over and over to refer to heaven. People think that when Jesus stepped into that cloud, when he ascended from the mountain back to his father, that he traveled several trillion light years to get there. No, he didn't. As soon as the cloud covered him, he was in heaven. That's the truth. It's in the Bible. You just have to read the Bible. I had to read it. I, didn't, I had pithy little sermons on heaven. I, I just didn't even look at them. I knew they were shallow. I hate, I just can't do shallow. I'm all in no matter what I do. When I played softball, I played softball all the way. I never walked onto that diamond that I didn't expect to win. And one day a guy said to me, he said, you're just too intense out here on this softball diamond. Aren't you a pastor? I said, yes, sir. And I'm even more intense because I'm a pastor. <laughs> I'm all in. I don't care what I do. So I went all in. I'm going to find out what this is. I cried. And I said to God, show me in the Bible what Shirley's doing right now. Wow. Brian, I didn't think I could live if I couldn't figure out what is she doing. And I found it. I found it. I read those verses on the Mount of Transfiguration so many times. Moses and Elijah appear. Peter, James, and John, and Jesus they don't speak to Peter, James, and John. They talk to Jesus. What did they talk about? This is really important. They talked about the rest of his days on the earth and what he was going to be doing for the kingdom's sake. That's what he was talking to them about, which told me something I didn't know. Those people who've gone on before us, people say, do they know do they know anything about us? Can they communicate with us? Let me tell you what that Mount of Transfiguration tells me. It tells me that those people in heaven know about the work of the kingdom of the Almighty God on this earth. They know about the works of the kingdom of God, the power of the kingdom. Perry can tell you that for 25 years, I've studied the kingdom of God. 
Lester Sumrall looked me in the face one day in my office and he told me two things. When I came into the office that day, he got there a little bit before me, he was looking at my bookshelves. And this is what he said to me. Why do you have so many books about the devil? I said, excuse me? All these books about, pull two or three of them out. Spiritual warfare, how to defeat the devil. He said, where are your Jesus books? I said, well, I, I want to know how to, how to fight the devil. He said, Jesus, get full of Jesus and you won't have to worry about him. Preach Jesus. Speak Jesus. Stop talking about what the devil is doing. No spiritual warfare tactics can be transferred from one person to another because your battle with the devil is different than my battle with the devil. Actually, spiritual warfare has its own DNA. And when spiritual warfare comes to you, what I did won't work for you. And what you did won't work for me. And you can buy all those spiritual warfare books that you want. I preach spiritual warfare. I mean, I tore it up from cover to cover. But when Lester Sumrall said to me, get rid of this garbage and get your focus on Jesus Christ and get full of Jesus Christ and have a manifestation of the power of the Almighty God and the devil will run from you. So to make a long story short, 16 messages on this thumb drive and there's a kingdom thumb drive out there and it has 20 messages on the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God operates within us and through us and why that will make a difference in your daily life. And if there's ever been something you needed to know, you need to know about the kingdom. You need to know the power of it and the glory. And you need to know why the entire New Testament is focused on the kingdom. And you need to know why the explosion of the early church was because of the kingdom. And I still believe to this day, if we will do two things, if the church will start worshiping again, just worship purely. You see, we've come to the to day of the all-stars. We've come to the day of making men of God like movie stars and women of God. And we revere them and we run after them. I tell you, the person you should be running after is the one who can lead you into worship. Oh, Rabbi Sataya. Who can take me into the throne room of God? Who can get me there? Because you see, when you get there, I'll tell you two things that will begin to happen. First of all, when you get into true, pure worship, the very nature and power of the Almighty God begins to flow into you. He transfers His nature into you. And what does that do? It brings a revelation of who He is. You can read all about it. You can read the scriptures, and I suggest you do that. But until the power of the Holy Spirit reveals to you what the scriptures are saying, you will never understand worship. You have to have a combination of the two. We want people to do everything for us today. This is the day of get somebody else to do it. But you see, God wants us to take the kingdom message out into our world. He wants us to go out, just like Jesus did, and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Almighty God. In Ecclesiastes chapter three and, and, and verse 11, the Bible says this. God has placed eternity in our hearts. You and I live in the world of doing. The kingdom is a world of being. In the kingdom you become. Here's the problem. We go out into our world every day and we're doing. And we do ministry this way. We're doing and doing and doing and doing. You hear of men who have heart attacks trying to build churches. You, have, you hear of men who fell into adultery while building mega churches. 12 mega church pastors in the last seven years fell in this nation because of sin or misappropriation of funds or divorce, something like that. Stop and think about that. One of them had 10,000 members and had campuses everywhere. He had an online Bible school, Bible college, Brian, with thousands of people. And he had an affair. And he'd been having an affair for years. And what does that tell you? You see, sometimes we get caught up in our own notoriety, our own reputations. I am nothing. I am nothing. 
And if I ever get up on any given day and think I'm something, I'm failing. I am nothing. Last three word, letters of a Christian, I-A-N, I am nothing. It's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I must rush along here. Obviously, we've lost the sense of eternity while we're here. Eternity refers to the future. It's, it's a longing or a sense of eternity, an innate knowledge that there's something far more out there than we're experiencing here. And so eternity is inside of us. Actually, I call it a GPS, a God positioning system. God is able to position you. The very word that Paul uses for redemption, to redeem in the New Testament, refers to slaves being redeemed out of the slave market. And that very word actually has the meaning of to locate. He comes to locate us. He always knows where we are. The problem is we don't always know where we are. We don't even always know where we are, spiritually speaking. Because we'll get caught up in a conversation and someone will begin to criticize another person. And we're not spiritually able to stop and rebuke them or walk away from it. Because while you're listening to that, you are being drained of Holy Spirit power. Just think about it. Or you even go so far as to engage in it. Now you've got to go and repent. I'm so thankful to God the, the way he, he, he devised redemption. How he redeems us. Because you see, I, I could really be up on the mountain. I mean, I could really, really be up high. I could be feeling really good. And then Satan comes along and tempts me. Knocks my feet out from under me. I think, and Satan wants you to believe, you just went back to where you started. In the kingdom, when kingdom knowledge and wisdom gets into you, no one and nothing can ever take away from you revelation from God in your spirit. So when you repent, you rise right back up to where you were you don't have to start all over. People are so beaten up today. I, I sinned, I, I, I was doing well, but I sinned. Oh, okay, repent. W what will happen then? You go right back to where you were because you can never forget revelation from God because it's not in your brain, it's in your spirit. Feed your spirit. Be healthy in your spirit. Come alive in the spirit. From the beginning, God assigned a human job description. I'm gonna give it to you very simply. We are to collectively rule over all living things on earth, animal and plant. We are responsible before God for life on earth. Whew. Oh my God. Uh, one more time. We are to collectively rule over all living things on earth, animal and plant. We're responsible for God for life on earth. Say, so where's that? Genesis chapter one. Read 27 through the end of the verse. We are to collectively rule over all living things on the earth, animal and plant. We're responsible before God for life on the earth. You and I are responsible for life on the earth. We should stop complaining about what people are doing, what government is doing. We should rise up. We should begin to manifest the kingdom of God where we are. People will be impressed by the manifestation of the kingdom of God. They may not even like you, but they will be really impressed with what God is doing with you and you'll gain their attention. And we can take our country back. It's very simple, all we have to live, do is live by this job description. So he equipped us for this purpose by creating us to function in a conscious, personal relationship of interactive responsibility with him. Hebrews chapter six, four and five, one more time. God has given us a picture of what our world looks like. Once people have seen the light, gotten a taste of heaven, been part of the work of the Holy Spirit, once they've personally experienced the sure goodness of God's word and the powers breaking in on us. The powers breaking in on us. I'm gonna give you six things and I'm gonna give you three things and I'm through. Six things first. 
you can be near the kingdom. Listen to the word of God. Luke chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus is instructing the 70, heal the sick in the towns and say to them, the kingdom of God has come close to you. So you can be close to the kingdom and not in it. You can be close. Go out and preach my gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, and tell people the kingdom of God has just come close to you. John chapter 3 and verse 3, you can see the kingdom. Unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what does the word see there mean? It's not talking about your physical eyes. It's talking about revelation. You can't see in your spirit what the kingdom of God is all about. Number three, keep moving with me here. Track with me here. There you go. It's not on this main. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you very much. Say this out loud with me. I can enter the kingdom. Unless a man is born of water and of the spirit and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can enter. Is it all right if I come down off of here? I'm, I'm like confined up here. I'm like a caged lion. I just got to move, Jesus. You can enter the kingdom. You've entered the kingdom of darkness. You've entered the kingdom of conflict. You've entered the kingdom of the enemy's attack against your marriage, against your children. You've entered the, you've entered the kingdom of drug addiction, alcohol addiction, sexual immorality, and sexual perversion. You've entered that kingdom. You didn't have a choice. It's all around you. And so you've entered that kingdom because the enemy's attacks. But he said, oh, oh, stop. You, you, sir, can enter the kingdom of heaven. And the one thing the enemy does not want you to do is enter the kingdom of heaven. He would rather you just be a Christian and go to church every week and pay your tithe and give your offerings and buy all the books and read all the books. And when you go out in the world, just keep your relationship with God as private as you possibly can so as not to make any kind of a disturbance or an uproar, but not so with those early guys. They went out, buddy, and let me tell you, they caused hell on earth. Or should I say they caused heaven on earth? They disturbed the government. They disturbed the political bureaucracy. They went around doing good and they got called on the carpet for it and they got arrested and then they got put in prison for it. But I'm gonna tell you, it's about time we enter the kingdom. It's about time we get up in the morning and we say, you know what, God? I, 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 I'm here, I'm here. And wherever you wanna take me today, that's all right. And whatever you wanna do with me today, that's all right. If, if you wanna bring somebody across my path that I've never seen, I don't know, I've never heard of them, and you want to tell me they have a need, I'll step into that world. I'll enter into the kingdom and the manifestation of the kingdom. Number four. Talk to me, computer. You can receive the kingdom. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Receive the gift. Listen to me. Not so long ago, I was in prayer and, and I was praying about all this stuff. Right? I, I just, I, I didn't grasp a lot of stuff. I, I said, God, I need revelation here. I, I've been doing this a long time. I need you to help me here. I, I don't get this. I don't understand. I'm chosen by you. I know I've been chosen. And the Holy Spirit said something to me right in the middle of a message. You, you know how that happens, right? You, you suddenly hear something and it's so startling to you that you're, you're like, how dummy, how'd you miss that? And, but you're preaching, you're speaking, you, you can't stop, you gotta keep going. And I said, yes, God, you did choose me. He said, you're chosen. And this is what he said, you must choose to be chosen. My mouth flew open. I stopped. You must choose to be chosen. Because you see, if you choose to be chosen, Satan will hate you. He will come against you. He'll try to destroy you. He'll just try to destroy your marriage, your children, your family, your finances, your health. He'll come after you with everything he's got. He never wants you to arrive on a day when you get up and you say, I choose to be chosen by God today for a manifestation of his mighty kingdom power. I choose to be chosen. There is a difference. There's a lot of people that have been chosen by God. The Bible tells us many are called. Few are 
chosen. Let's talk about possessing the kingdom because the Bible says you can possess the kingdom. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. The kingdom of heaven has endured violent assault and violent men seize it by force. I read this thing for years. I could not understand it. I tried. I looked at the Greek words. I, I called Dr. Arrington. I should send him an honorarium. You should send him an honorarium in my honor. <laughs> you and Brian both should send him an honorarium. Say, this is in honor of Tony Scott who bugs you to death. <laughs> I said, Dr. Aaron, I, 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 I'm, I'm missing something here. And he said, do what I always told you. Pick out the key words, set them aside, and go see what they mean. What's the root? Put that verse back up, please. Don't take it down till I tell you. The kingdom of heaven has here in violent assault. See the word violent assault? Violent men. It comes from the word bios in the Greek, from which we get our word Biology. The science of life. So what in the world is he saying? And why did the translators put it like this? Because there's just a fine line there about the translation of this and the interpretation of it. And the fine line rests on the word bios. And this is what God is actually saying to us. The kingdom of heaven is going to, Listen to, listen to the word suffer. Endured is there, but it's also the word has suffered violent assault. The kingdom of heaven has had an invasion of Jesus Christ. And in that invasion of Jesus Christ, men became empowered to go out and take the kingdom by force. And so I said, God, I got to see this. Show me how that, I don't get this. And he gave me a mental picture and I found the picture to back it up. When I was a little boy, we had sidewalks. I lived in old neighborhoods. We were poor. Poor people called us poor. I never had a new bicycle. I had an old bicycle made at the junkyard. My dad went down, had the guy take two or three bicycles and give me a bicycle. Welded it and all that good stuff. It didn't matter to me and it didn't make any sense to me, but the guy that welded it said to my dad, this bike is stronger than a new bike because that weld won't break, whereas that new bike will. Well, I could care less. I wanted a new bike. I didn't get it. It made me angry. So when I grew up and I went to pastor, I said, I'm going to make sure the little kids get a bicycle. And in Toledo, Ohio, we have the Noel Project. And for the last 40 years, we've given away 36,000 brand new bicycles in the inner city. I'm going to kick sand in that devil's face as long as I'm on this earth. I ride down through the inner city of, of Toledo and I can see those bicycles here. I saw kids the day we had it. We didn't get to have it last year. The year we, we did last year very small because they didn't want us to do anything. But, but two years ago, the last time we had the big one, because we'd have, we'd have a thousand people. We'd have 500 families there. Five, 500 kids, I'm sorry. We'd have 500 kids there. Then it grew to 700. Last time we gave them away, it was over 900 kids Walked out there with a brand new bicycle. Yeah, it costs a lot of money. I, it's not in our budget. I never worry about it. I never think about it. I pray about it. I make the need known. Every year the money comes in. See? Because that's a kingdom ministry, you see. We're trying to get God to give us handouts for things that aren't kingdom-minded. They're man-minded. And, and, and so the Lord let me see, Mona, a sidewalk like those old sidewalks in my neighborhood where that big oak tree, one of the roots off of it grew under that slab and lifted it up about four inches. We love that because you get a running start with your bike and boom, jump. But if you're walking down the road and you hit that baby, you're probably going to end up face first on the... And that root that pushed up that four inch, four by four concrete slab probably weighed one-tenth what that concrete slab weighed, but the life inside the root pushed the concrete up. He said, there's going to come, I don't even have time to do this. What time do we have to dismiss? I, I have, I'm sorry. I went over the last time and I was here for another main event and you forgot. 
Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's your maturity. <laughs> Your maturity is showing. <laughs> All right, let me finish these and I'll come back to this. So, so he, he said, when Jesus came, I'll just go ahead and do it now. Second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. Entropy is the measure of disorder in a system, no matter what the system is. So once something is wound up, it starts winding down. No matter what it is, you get a brand new car, you're going to be spending some money on it in about a year. Now these newer cars, probably six months. And, and if you, the longer you keep it, it's winding down. So the, the, the second law of thermodynamics, thermodynamics is the study of energy. Basically, life is energy. Actually, the universe, the universe is not about matter. It's about energy. Life is energy. So second law of thermodynamics says that when a system begins to wind down, there has to be an outside force that comes into that system to rescue it or transform it. So way back in the book of Genesis, we see spiritual entropy because Eve ate of the fruit and she gave it to Adam and he ate of the fruit and sin and chaos came into our world. And when they came into our world, there was nothing that could arrest that force of sin. And the whole thing began to deteriorate. Paul himself said in Romans, the whole creation itself is moaning under the grip of sin. But here comes Jesus riding down the staircase of heaven. And he arrived as a baby in a manger in a stable in Bethlehem and nobody thought much about it. Herod wanted him killed just because they thought he was a boy. But I'm gonna tell you when that Jesus came and when he was born, he interrupted that system of chaos. And he said, I've come to restore order in the system. So all we gotta do is go manifest Jesus. Get full of Jesus and just let him bleed through you. I walked into a restaurant the other day. I, I go there to get a kitty sandwich, turkey, whole grain bread, the way you're supposed to eat. <laughs> you know, I've had this war going on. <laughs> and I'm getting ready to leave. And the Lord said to me, Give her $100. I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> he said, give her $100. I knew that recently she'd gone through a divorce. She has a three-year-old. She's working in a sandwich shop. She doesn't make a lot of money. She doesn't have a lot of money. And before I left, I pulled out my wallet. Thankfully, I had $100. God knew I had $100. And I gave her $100, Brian. And she sent me a text. I know them because I call up there sometime and order ahead of time. And I was just trying to figure out how, Pam, I might make a little more money. Listen. The kingdom is in your world every day with opportunities. We're just too blind to see them. We're too busy. We're running through life. And you need to slow down and stop and look at the faces and look at the eyes of people and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's a young girl that waited on Shirley and I and Bob Evans restaurants. We, we, we ate there for 40 years and... and um, I'm still worried about that m lipstick on that mic. It's bothering me. I don't know. <laughs> she was so faithful to wait on us, and she had twins. And I, I went in there one day, and you could tell she'd been crying. And Shirley had had a meeting, and I, she, she, she didn't wait on us that day. She came by the table. I said, how are you doing? How are things going? She said, well, you know my husband left me. Twins about nine months old. 
So I, I, I said, well, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to tell Shirley. We're going to pray. I was there a few weeks later. And I was getting ready to leave and was going to pay my bill. Shirley had already left. And I paid my bill and the, the Lord said, give her $100. This was when I didn't have $100. I was shocked that I had $100. Shirley never let me have $100. And I took it back in, Brian, and I walked over to where she was. I just shook hands with her, and the money was in it, folded up. And she said, what, what is this? I said, the Lord told me to give you that. Oh, she started crying. Now I'm on the spot. I'm so glad that back then we didn't have the iPhones with cameras because she grabbed me, bear hugged me right in the middle of the restaurant. There had been 57 pictures in the Toledo Blade the next day when I had these stinking <laughs> This is what she said to me. You know, my twins have grown up now and I need a carrier, a double carrier, and I needed a hundred dollars. <laughs> That's kingdom people. What, how might I serve you today, Lord? Who's, who's, who are you bringing across my path today, God? When I leave this meeting today and I go eat, what about that waitress that waits on me? What about the person I pay at the cashier? What about the place where I buy gas? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do, oh God? Yeah, yeah. You can possess the kingdom. Next. Perry, you need to get a faster computer. Jesus, help us, Lord. I'll send you an offering next week. <laughs> you can be possessed, I'll just prophetically speak it, by the kingdom. You can possess it, and you can be possessed by it. What does it say? Read, the kingdom of God is with within you. And Jonathan, I don't mean to mess with you. You're such a wonderful person to help me. But if, if you could put that expanded translation of, of Mark 115 up there for me uh, really quick. Okay, I, I, I want you to see this. Boy, that was fast. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you see what faith will do? <laughs> Read it out loud with me. Literal translation. All the preliminaries have been taken care of, he said. And the rule of God is now accessible to to who? Everyone. Just look at someone and say, you're everyone. everyone. Alright, read on. Review your plans for living and base your life on this remarkable new opportunity. Wow. One more time. All the preliminaries have been taken care of, he said. And the rule of God is now accessible to everyone. Review your plans for living and base your life on this remarkable new opportunity. Base your life. I ask people to do things, well, I'm so busy. I said, you're busy living. I'm talking about the kingdom. See, the kingdom is number one in your life or it's nothing. Either God will be number one or you really don't have a personal intimate relationship with God of interactive responsibility where he can commend you and you go do his will. Three things that Jesus said about the manifestation of the kingdom and I'll be finished, I promise. It won't take more than 30 minutes, I promise. <laughs> if you could find those for me, Jonathan, just put those up there, number one what Jesus said about his kingdom, what he did. He taught, listen to me, he taught only the message of the kingdom. That's the only message Jesus had. I have come to confer upon you a kingdom. Look at the verse, read. I must preach the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God, Come on, talk to me, help me. The gospel, y'all are really. S Can you get some real coffee out there or something in the mornings for heaven's sake? I must preach the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God to other cities and towns also, for I was sent for this purpose. Do you see those last few lines? What did he come for? To give you the gospel of the kingdom. 
If I could tell you anything as a young man, if, if, if I could impress anything upon you as a young man with such gifts and talents and abilities, Perry, told me so much about you. I would say to you what Lester Sumrall said to me, and this is what he told me, two things. He said, Tony, focus on the kingdom and learn the covenant. Focus on the kingdom and learn the covenant. Sometime in the next 20 years, I'd like to come back and talk about the covenant with you. <laughs> next, number two, second thing. He manifested, read it with me. He manifested his kingdom presence in a way that could only be explained supernaturally. Can I just ask you a question? Can you describe what happens in your church only by using the word supernatural on the weekend? Is what happens in your church only definable by saying it's supernatural? Two months ago, two and a half months ago, Roy walked into our church. Number one drug dealer in Sandusky County for 30 years and never got arrested one time. He had given his heart to Jesus five years earlier. He came and at the close of the service, he came down, uh, Perry, and fell in the altar, weeping. I talked with him, prayed with him. He said, my wife is on the streets. She's lived on the streets off and on for 20 years. She's a drug addict. But I've never divorced her. God told me not to because I was a drug dealer for 30 years. She has affairs. When she has no money, she'll go have an affair with a guy to get money. It was almost like a modern day Jose and Gomer, to be honest with you. I want you to pray that somehow God will save her soul. I prayed with him. The next week, he comes walking in with this woman. When she drove on the lot, she said to him, he told me after church, why am I crying? Why am I crying? He said, because you're under conviction. And this is a church that has conviction. She came to the altar. I prayed for her. Had my intercessors gather around her. Next week, they brought their son. RJ, he got saved. Three weeks later, a daughter who said she'd never come came. She got saved. All of them in drugs. All of them taking drugs. Last Saturday night, I look and he's got like got 10, 12 people around him. <laughs> oh God. I give the altar call. His, his, his wife comes up. He comes up. RJ comes up. Victoria comes up. And one by one, those people start getting up. I said to Victoria, the daughter afterwards, I said, she was living with a man for 10 years, a married man for 10 years. She said, get out of my life. I'm done with you. I found Jesus. No rehab. No rehab. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. I said to Victoria, who are all these people? She said, both of them been married before they got children. She said, there's like a dozen of us. And she said, I don't remember what she said. Five or six of us have now already given our hearts to Jesus. She said, and guess what? Guess what? She said, I brought my mother today. My mother would never go to church. <laughs> If what's happening in your church on the weekend doesn't need the word supernatural, you might want to call a prayer meeting. <laughs> you might want to start fasting because this world is in a mess. <laughs> Last thing Jesus said. He manifested his kingdom presence in a way that can only, did I say that already? Is there another one there? I can't even remember where I'm at in the message. It doesn't really matter. Give me the scripture if he didn't, if there's not another one. Stand with me, please. I 
I would not want Lift up your hands and just honor the presence of the Holy Spirit, would you? Let me tell you about kingdom people. They never let challenges in their life limit them. They limit their challenges. They limit their challenges. The world is all about deforming you with sin. The kingdom is all about transforming you. We've never seen a divorce rate like we're seeing with the increases, the number of, the percentage of increase like it's going up over the last few years. COVID, the economy, lots of things play into that, I realize. But the divorce rate among ministry people is alarming. I cannot tell you how many times a minister and his wife have called Shirley and I to counsel with them. They drive from several states away. They knew that we would be covenant people. We would never, ever tell anybody they came. And they would come. Hurting marriages, wounded people. People have learned how to smile when they come to church. And they can put on a front so that you'll never know inside. It's hard for them to take their next spiritual breath. You, you are responsible for the manifestation of, key, of the kingdom in your church because it only takes one person to get on fire and start praying and believing God and operating in the gifts of the Spirit to set a whole church on fire. One shall put a thousand to flight, two shall put 10,000 to flight. The math is there. And here's what I ask you. I, I, I just ask you in Jesus' name. And Roy, I know you don't mind me saying this. The guy I told you about a moment ago, I didn't even know he was here. Hold up your hand, Roy. There he is with his wife, beautiful people. That's called supernatural. Supernatural. What goes on in your church must be described as being supernatural. And if it isn't, let me tell you something. You do not have a manifestation of the kingdom because the kingdom is 100% supernatural. Supernatural.